All right, now I think I've got everything set up and let me just get the slides up. Okay, um, so I'm going to uh, jump into a new set of connected lectures today. And these lectures are going to build directly on what we spoke about together a couple weeks ago. Just very briefly to tie it in, we had been speaking about the fact that Donald Trump had been indicted in Manhattan uh, court and, and on 34 different counts. We'll get into a little bit of a refresher on that in just a moment. And the question of whether or not the American legal system could bear the stress of trying a former president and how that relates to the question of how much trust, confidence, faith there is in our legal and judicial institutions. And I presented some evidence that they're at a pretty low point uh, when we look at public opinion research on this, and that this reflects the widespread perception that the American legal system is un fair, and in particular, that it is uh, a system that treats privileged people differently, and that has been instrumentalized by the wealthy, by the powerful, by the political and corporate elite to uh, bring about an unfair social situation, uh, unfair distribution of income, of power, of uh, status within our society. And, and, and so um, I, I want to start uh, trying to think through something I said in that lecture. It, it was a point in passing, but I think it deserves greater attention. And that is that we don't just think in terms of retrospective justice for Donald Trump. And if he committed crimes and used the power vested by the people in his office to do our work, then he needs to be held accountable, both to uh, redeem the principle of equality under, law, under the law and also to deter future potential abuses of power, right? So uh, I'm not saying that we should not prosecute Trump, but I did very clearly argue that we should not expect the prosecution of Trump to produce anything like a political consensus in our society that Trump actually deserved to be prosecuted or that our legal system is administering impartial justice, as opposed to thinking that uh, a substantial portion of the American population, at least a third, is going to think that Donald Trump was the victim of a political witch hunt and that there's nothing impartial or fair about this. And this is just yet another episode in this long history of the American legal system being used by the powerful to punish uh, ordinary people or those who stand up for ordinary people. And I realized that none of us has, has, has much sympathy for that perspective, but I also think we have to be realistic about the fact that we cannot expect our justice system to somehow do the work that our political system, our media system, our culture and society as a whole has been unable to do. And, and so I suggested, as opposed to focusing exclusively on retrospective justice, we also focus on prospective justice. And, and, and in saying that, what I meant was not just holding Donald Trump accountable, but also trying to repair the basis for trust in and, and, and confidence in mainstream American institutions. And that really involves repairing American society, addressing the sources of the grievances, and trying to clarify, right, in which capacity has our legal system, have our courts, have our other mainstream institutions been complicit with an unfair and frankly inhumane distribution of advantages and vulnerabilities over the last 40 years, and 
in what ways have they not, right? And, 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 and to be able to repair the underlying sense that something is really rigged, something is really wrong, something is really unfair in order to redeem what our institutions do when they function well. And, and so that brings me to building a better economy, right? And, and, and I take that in a very broad sense. And, and, and so I, I do mean uh, addressing inequality in our society. And by that, I mean income inequality and especially inequality of wealth. But I also mean addressing status inequality, inequalities of race and gender to do with national origin and to do with sexuality as well. And also, even more importantly, perhaps, creating good jobs, jobs that affirm the dignity of the people who hold them, that allow them to feel that they are included in a cooperative enterprise that wants their input, that creates avenues for their advancement, and also jobs and an economy that allow for a balanced way of life, that do not demand complete devotion and dedication, that do not take so much time that people feel stretched to the point of breaking if they're also trying to do other duties like care for their families or trying to be involved in American civil life. And finally, of course, jobs and an economy that is ecologically sustainable. So, so building a better economy means an economy that caters to the full range of human goods. We need an economy to help us in fulfilling. And some of those goods are narrowly economic to do with income and wealth, but some of those goods are much more broad social goods. I've put uh, on the uh, cover here two um, uh, images, and one of which I, I know I've shown you before, Francisco Goya's gift for the master from the very end of the 18th century, in which Goya portrays, I think, very starkly, right, uh, not just the vulnerability and um, poverty generated by an unequal economy, but also the status inequality and insecurity, the, 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 the groveling, the deference, the uh, complete disdain that Goya captures in this image seem to me to get at some of the more profound psychological dimensions of an unequal society. On the other side, <clears throat> I've placed uh, one of Diego Rivera's murals, this one from uh, Detroit, the Detroit Industry North Wall. And this one's from 1933. So, so from really the depths of the Great Depression, but also the beginning of the New Deal. And this image I think is an interesting contrast. It, it, it shows a group and I hope you can make it out. It, it's the best reproduction I can find, but the, it's, it's, it's a little blurry. I suspect that actually reflects the, the nature of the mural itself, uh, a, a, an interracial group. I, I believe there are whites and African-Americans and Latinos all working. I believe it's the Ford Motor Company that they're working at. But there's a kind of almost heroism of the worker, a, a, a sense that these men, and it is a very masculinist image, I think we have to acknowledge that, are working together and that, that the work that they're doing indicates their power and their contribution, that there's something highly cooperative and collaborative about it, and that it's integrated into a broader context of productivity that will ultimately pull the society as a whole out from the Great Depression, right? And, and, and so two different visions re represented artistically of the potentials of our economy. Just to refresh your memories, I doubt they need refreshing at this point. 
Donald Trump is in what appears to be a world of legal trouble, right? And, and so he's already been indicted in Manhattan, 34 counts, and they uh, seem to uh, range from falsifying business records through state and federal campaign election law violations to tax fraud. And we will have to see how that plays out. And, and then Congress has recommended to the Department of Justice that he be prosecuted. The Department of Justice has a special counsel investigating him, both for events related to the January 6th insurrection and the efforts to overturn the election more broadly speaking, and to his retention of classified information after he left the presidency and um, the obstruction of efforts to recover those documents. And if you're following the news, you probably know on the one hand that Jack Smith is having great success in court in terms of uh, overcoming all of Trump's and his associates' objections to forcing them to testify to the grand jury. So it does appear that that investigation continues to make headway. We don't know yet whether it will result in indictments, but it does look like there's a lot of momentum in that direction at the moment. You probably also know that uh, the House of Representatives will be having uh, hearings in Manhattan the day after tomorrow, in part to attack what the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg is doing. And, and, and so already signs that things are starting to heat up and that a lot more could be coming down the pike in terms of legal uh, focus on Donald Trump. There's also the investigation in Georgia, and there are 23 total cases, either active or pending, in both civil and criminal courts in the United States. And, and, and so all of this to say that our legal system faces a stress test because the person being put on trial is the former president of the United States, the leading candidate for the opposition party's presidential nominee, now uh, a year and a half away from the actual election. And please note that the indictment of him a couple of weeks ago has not dampened, but in fact appears to have increased the enthusiasm for Donald Trump. His polling has gone up. That may be a short-term effect, but nevertheless, it certainly indicates that Donald Trump remains a active, viable leader of one of the main parties in our democracy. And, and so this raises the question, can the courts do what they need to do in um, vindicating the principles of equality under the law and accountability of our officials and other powerful uh, individuals should they abuse the power that they have? Um, I've already argued two weeks ago that I don't think that there's really any chance that the trial even the successful conviction of Donald Trump would result in a breaking of the fever, a returning of the United States to a less polarized and frankly less hostile and mean form of politics uh, in the aftermath. And, and here I will just state the obvious, though history of the 20th and 21st century are littered with examples of populist right-wing leaders running afoul of the law, in fact, being indicted, tried, convicted, and nevertheless regaining or retaining political power. We can paint, point to Adolf Hitler here and the, the way in which ultimately his trial um, led to his uh, ability to capture national attention in the Weimar Republic and ultimately launched his broader political appeal, the eventual rise of the Nazi party with Adolf Hitler at its helm. We can jump to the present moment with Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel 
being investigated for corruption and possibly uh, pending indictment, right? And, and, and going after the independence of the judiciary in Israel. We can look at Silvio Berlusconi in Italy. All of this to say societies that expect that their legal system are going to excise the destructive disease of right-wing populism from their politics are often sorely disappointed. But even if we just focus on, on, on the two ideas, equality under the law, accountability for abuse of power, again, this assumes that the judicial system is capable of establishing a shared sense of what actually happened. And I just don't think that is the case in 21st century America. This will be perceived to be a political trial. It is in certain respects, a trial of a leading political figure. And that in an era of hyper-partisanship and a moment of epistemic anarchy in which as we're seeing with the Dominion case against Fox News, the major spokespersons, the leading, I'm hesitant to call them journalists, but opinion figures in the most widely viewed network in the United States, it has now been clearly revealed, will say behind closed doors that they think that the person they're covering is demonic, dangerous, and absolutely untruthful and then get on the air and parrot exactly what he says and treat him as if he's a respectable statesman. And, and so again, if, if one of the things we rely on is our institutions reinforcing each other, our media system validating what our judiciary says, as long as the judiciary seems to be operating impartially, I don't think we can rely on that in the United States in the 2020s. It's also the case, and I, I think this again comes out of Dominion, um, why did Tucker Carlson say in emails and text messages that he found the people who Trump was bringing on the air or Fox was bringing on the air to say that the election had been stolen to be totally uncredible, right? To, 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 to be completely laughable. Um, and yet when they brought them on the air to treat them as respect worthy and newsworthy, well, in part, I think because we live in a moment where our social media have become a dominant media system and they have encouraged us to uh, demand that we hear, see, listen to only those ideas that confirm what we already believe, right? And, 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 and that the failure to be presented with information that uh, confirms what we believe, even what we believe is false, somehow constitutes disrespect and an insult, an injury to us, right? And, and, and so, again, I think these are social conditions that don't bode well for any court being able to change our minds about uh, what our political leaders may or may not have done. Um, and finally, as, as I will really focus on today, and, and just to reiterate, right, that this is a moment of deep mistrust of many mainstream institutions, and that extends to the judiciary. Um, and then we have, right, Donald Trump himself. And I, I go back to his address uh, from March, although there were um, campaign online advertisements that were aired just yesterday, in which Donald Trump said that uh, when he regains the presidency, he will do a major overhaul of the Department of Justice and FBI to root out the kind of corrupt stuff that's going on right now, and that he will direct civil rights investigations into local attorney generals and district attorneys. And, and, and please note that category, right? Civil rights. Who's 
civil rights are being violated by these investigations. That's a, a fairly precise category in American law. And it's one thing to say that Alvin Bragg's investigation and indictment of Donald Trump are politically motivated. And, and I, I think you can, you know, at least make a credible case that that, that is true. But to say that it is a civil rights violation of Donald Trump, I think is, is uh, you know, rather obvious dog whistling or race baiting. The two district attorneys at the local level in Manhattan and Georgia who are investigating Donald Trump are both African-American. And I think he is in a sense just you know, very strategically throwing the category civil rights back at them uh, to, to weaponize at the same time that he discredits the true and proper sense of, of that category. So having said all of that, right, Trump is defending himself by attacking the institutions that are targeting him which means he is ultimately trying to defend himself by tearing down the judicial and legal system of the United States, as well as other, quote, liberal institutions like the Department of Justice and the FBI. I'm not exactly sure really when those became liberal institutions, but I think that this is a strategy that is actually quite likely to succeed with his base. And we've got to understand why. And that is because he treats attacks on him as attacks on a large portion of the American population who feel disrespected and status insecure, feel that these institutions have done nothing for them for a very long time and are therefore inclined to illiberalism, inclined to attack civil rights, inclined to attack the judiciary, the rule of law, because they view them as the commitments of the people who have stolen their status, their security, and who don't care for them, but instead treat them as deplorable, disrespect them, right? And, and, and so all of that to say, Trump's attacks on district attorneys, the judiciary, the FBI, the Department of Justice fall on fertile ground. And, and, and so I do think we have to take this seriously. And that leads us to ask, what is it? How is it that so many Americans became susceptible to, frankly, this kind of manipulation, this kind of mobilization against core institutions of democracy, institutions that have, if they are operating correctly, no partisan slant at all? And, and so that then leads me to, to review again briefly that Americans' trust in major institutions is at an all-time low. Our trust in the federal government is abysmally low. 24% of the people say they trust it. Roughly three-quarters don't trust it. Similarly, 70% don't trust the courts, believe that they favor the wealthy. 80% believe that there are two justice systems, one for the rich and powerful, one for the rest of us. And all of the component institutions out of which the rule of law is built have low ratings of trust and confidence in America in the 21st century. And the reason for this, I think, is complex. I, I, I don't want to be reductive, and, and I think I might have been a little bit too reductive in what I said to you a couple of weeks ago, but one major source of widespread and frankly justified mistrust is the sense that the American government failed not only to respond, but actually engineered a highly unequal and unfair society. The opinion research bears this out, right? 66% of Americans feel that the federal government 
is responsible for too much inequality in our society. And all you have to do is to look at the tax code to see that that is the case. When we look at what has happened to American society, the vast increase in inequality, the deep spread of economic insecurity, the tremendous wealth that has been created, but the decline of the share of that wealth that is paid out in wages to workers, and so the resulting stagnation and erosion of wages and standard of living, all of that bears out the idea that on the one hand, our government has become incapable and perhaps not particularly interested in doing anything about widespread economic vulnerability, and further, that it is actually complicit, that it is engineering or uh, assisting those who are furthering inequality. And I, I want to be as, as again, as clear as possible about this. I'm showing a slightly different diagram this time, that um, this is not just that more people are precarious, are having a harder time making ends meet, are in further debt, that 40% of the population has $400 or less in savings. It is that the collapse of the industrial economy in the United States over the last 40 years, the disappearance of good work of jobs that were unionized, that had set schedules that contained the possibility for increased income, promotion, and economic mobility. The, the complete disintegration of a large portion of the American economy not only means that a huge portion of formerly middle-class people have moved down and out of the middle class and now find themselves to be deeply vulnerable. It also means that their sense of belonging in, contribution to, and respect from American society has collapsed. Uh, Anne Case and Angus Deaton who do the work on deaths of despair. And as you can see, this is uh, the, the better diagram. If you are white and have less than, uh, or don't have a college education, right? Your death rate has been going up rapidly over the last 30 years. And that's from drugs, alcohol, suicide, right? Hence deaths of despair. That, that they refer to this increase in mortality as being uh, accounted for by a collapse of a pillar supporting working class life, and that was work. So, so work is not just a way of getting income, but work as a source of social status, belonging, a community, a place you go where you feel like you have purpose and meaning, and that has been pulled out from under millions of Americans. And it is profoundly unfair in terms of what it's done to the distribution of income and wealth. It also is obvious that there's a lack of mainstream political action being addressed to this issue. And it calls into question the very capacity of government to protect the vulnerable in our society. So, so that is a, a, a first source, right, of, of, of the uh, deep lack of confidence in the impartiality, in the responsiveness, in the fairness of mainstream American institutions, especially the legal system, and it extends to the judiciary, whether fairly or not, and, and I'm going to suggest in a moment quite fairly, but there's a broader context here, right? What I've just concentrated on is really the last 40 years. But people remember more than the last 40 years. They, they, Many people remember back to the middle of the 20th century, or at least they have a sense of that history. And so they recognize that we began the 20th century. These are Thomas Piketty's uh, diagrams. I could also have drawn on Robert Putnam, who's done similar work, that we began the 20th century 
as a very unequal society. But as we moved our way through the 20th century, we became a much more equal society in terms both of wealth and in terms of income. And then as we entered the last quarter of the 20th century, inequality began to grow. And it has grown ever since to the point where we are now as unequal as we were 120 years ago. And, and the relevance of the longer term perspective, and in particular, what's sometimes called the Great Compression in the middle, is on the one hand that it's set expectations. A whole group of people were pulled into the middle class, and they expected that they would continue to remain in the middle class. And, and so those expectations uh, are shattered, but it is the contrast between where they expected to be and where they ended up that I think animates a lot of the anger, the mistrust, the grievance in our politics. And then there's the, the, the second lesson of this longer picture of history, which is that when government wants to, it can address inequality. And, and, and that may be a bit simplified, but having said that, it is uh, also the case that I think there's a widespread sense, and again, I don't think it's completely misplaced, that if we wanted to, if we cared to, we could reduce inequality in our society because we did it once already. And so the fact that we're not doing it, the fact that we are becoming more and more in unequal indicates either indifference or intention, indifference to the plight, the suffering of a big portion of the American population, or intention in the sense that the people in charge have greater sympathy with the wealthy people who they have more in common with than they do with people who are suffering as a result of the economic changes that the powerful are engineering. So, right. All of that to say, when I say there's mistrust in our major institutions, you can see again from the longer term picture that we had quite high trust in the middle of the 20th century when our government had just successfully lifted a large portion of the population into middle class status. And as we stopped doing that, as the distribution of wealth and income returned to high levels of inequality, the trust cratered, right? And political alienation, the vast majority of Americans now believe that the government serves a few big interests and does not work for the benefit of all, completely reversing the opposite ratio from the middle of the 20th century. So I want to just note quickly um, why and how the legal political and judicial institutions in the United States have been complicit in creating this inequality. I could have put a hundred books uh, on the slide here. I chose three, Katerina Pistorov's work, which I'm working with quite closely with right now, I find very um, illuminating. And, and her book is called The Code of Capital. And what's interesting is she doesn't focus on legislation per se. She focuses much more on judge and lawyer made law, on contract law, on corporate law, on liability law, and the way in which we have, especially over the last 50 years, used the law to distribute risks and opportunities in a way that are highly skewed and that really the, 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 the effort on the part of the financial sector to capture the relevant portions of the law is largely responsible for the vast growth in the financialization of our economy and the tremendous inequality it's produced. And, and then uh, Jacob Hacker, Paul Pearson from Yale and UC Berkeley um, in two books separated by about a decade, Winner Take All Politics and Let Them Be Tweets, I think show uh, on the one hand the way in which um, neoliberal economic ideas 
were used to justify an approach to legislation that scaled back state efforts to prop up the middle class that resulted in much greater inequality. And then in the second book, the way in which in particular, uh, the Republican Party in the aftermath of, of a bipartisan, I think we have to be as clear as possible about that effort to globalize, financialize the economy, and as a result to produce much greater inequality has directed, channeled the anger that uh, this produced into scapegoats, into blaming immigration, into blaming China, into blaming the government and its policies of affirmative action, et cetera, for the growth of inequality in our society. And, and so again, to review quickly, right, the law and the courts have actively participated in making the 21st century much more unequal and unfair. I don't think I need to go into all of this, but, but again, the way in which financial and corporate law have, contract law, have, have shifted risks away from corporations and uh, into individuals the way in which the distribution of gain and loss have, have been such that the rich are protected against loss while they continue to be able to gain, the way in which our domestic courts enforce international law while international firms just shop for the right venue. Give me one second. It's gotten very warm in here. I, I gotta open the window and turn the fan on. Um, so we, we, we add to that, right? The international trade agreements that have opened the domestic worker to international wage competition, which resulted in both deindustrialization, de the disappearance of a whole bunch of jobs that were, in retrospect, very good jobs, and also driven wages down in the remaining portion of the industrial economy in the United States, the effort to make unionization more difficult, the erosion of the value of government benefits, the welfare reform, the erosion of, of, of the worth of the minimum wage, uh, et cetera. All of this, right, is, I think, a, a very clear bill of indictment against the federal government and, and, and the way in which our legal system has opened itself up to being used by the rich and powerful to increase their share of income and wealth in our society at the expense of the middle class and the working classes. And then we might just add one more thing here, right? Which is, is that we really have not shown the energy and initiative that other societies have shown in addressing these problems and, and those other societies, we could point to earlier periods in American history. We could point in particular to the progressive era and the New Deal and the way in which when in the late 19th and first third of the 20th century, there was widespread economic inequality, governments first at the state and then at the federal level became very active in promoting equality, security, trying to create jobs for the jobless and, and our complete failure to do that in the 21st century. Or we could point to Canada, Germany, Norway, Austria, South Korea, so societies that have made much more of an effort to create better jobs for their citizens as their economies transform and, and the failure of the United States federal government to really attach much importance or to make serious efforts in these regards. Now, 
there are other classes of, of, of reason why there's widespread mistrust and alienation. And, and, and here I'm correcting a little bit what I said to you a couple of weeks ago, where I really focused on economic inequality and the sense that the federal government, including the legal system and the courts, were part of generating that inequality. Today, I want to add two other factors, right? Um, uh, the first, a sense that the government favors others in remedying injustice. And, and, and here by others, I mean those besides the members of the currently vulnerable and precarious, formerly secure white working class. And, and I would point you to Harley Hochschild's work in Strangers in Their Own Land, but a, a whole bunch of work that we've talked about together that, that shows that particularly white working class Americans feel like the American dream has stalled, that, that it used to be that if you worked hard, got a good job, were patient, you could work your way to economic security. And now that just doesn't work anymore. But part of the issue is that the government is prioritizing putting other people in line to economic security in front of the white working class in particular african americans latinos other recent immigrants those who liberals have greater sympathy with right um and that in a sense the idea that what's going on really is profound structural changes in our economy, globalization, automation, and the way in which technology is transforming the workplace, as well as changes in the power dynamic of the economy, that feels to many people like the thing that liberal talking heads say on MSNBC, right? It doesn't feel credible. It doesn't have the emotional resonance that many people want. It is, in a sense, the way the privileged talk and think, and the people who feel like they've been excluded don't want to have to replicate that way of analyzing society in order to be able to give vent to their grievances. So, so this leads to uh, deep mistrust of mainstream media, of anybody who talks in terms of structural uh, explanations for growing inequality, and faith instead in Fox News and Trump and QAnon and the big lie that these accounts, it's, it's all because of immigration, it's all because of China, it's all because the election was stolen from you or the deep state is working against you, have a power uh, that is, I think, frankly, often the case with scapegoating theories. They personalize an explanation and many of us feel uh, like a personalistic explanation that you can point at someone as opposed to an anonymous structural force is more persuasive. It is one way to put this a better fit for the implicit feeling structures of an important range of Americans. Um, another source of widespread mistrust and alienation, right? So, so this one has to do primarily with race, right? And, 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 and whether or not we can target racial minorities as they seem to gain greater acceptance, recognition, and wealth power in our society. A second, or I guess really third explanation is a wide, widespread normative threat and disorientation. Right. And so we are becoming quite rapidly a post traditional society. I'm, I'm not going to put the data on the board. We've looked at it together on previous occasions, but the vast majority of Americans change their religion, marry somebody from a different religion. 25% of children today do not uh, think that they can be categorized by the gender that was assigned to them at birth. 
uh, women are outpacing men in terms of uh, educational attainment and gay marriage is the law of the land. We, we, we can keep going, but right, the sense that our culture is changing rapidly and that it is disorienting that people who used to be respected for conforming with traditional cultural norms, expectations, and roles are now challenged or even despised, considered to be deplorable for maintaining the taken for granted traditional second nature way of performing race, gender, sexuality. And, and so um, the idea that, that those ideas are rejected by a large portion of the population, that if they're going to be maintained, they have to be actively and coercively imposed. Um, and the sense that this just doesn't make sense anymore, that this is disorienting as well as deeply challenging, is leading a lot of people to look for a reimposition of tradition via authority, right? And 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 my final claim here is is that so these two factors are generating status anxiety from our culture, and I don't think right we can compatible with justice deny the legitimacy of these claims, but they are being reinforced and amplified by economic inequality. And that is something we can and should do something about. That is what justice demands of us. And we have to hope, we have to not only hope, but aim to be able to show we can address, address economic inequality and the social insecurity that growing inequality has generated while remaining a diverse and tolerant society. So the final thing to notice here is that the Republican Party under Donald Trump, but really going back to the Tea Party, and in a sense earlier than that, but, but really it's only in the last decade that this has come to the fore, has become the party that succeeds electorally by channeling <clears throat> the anger and the grievance of the portion of the American population that feels left out by the wealth creation of the last 40 years, that feels challenged by the diversification of America and the growing liberty or um, emancipation from traditional norms, that, that the Republican Party has become the party for the expression of reaction against all three of those forces. And it has done so by taking class and racial resentment and channeling it into mistrust of all mainstream institutions. And so in that environment, I think we have to be particularly concerned, particularly attuned to the history here of, uh, about the health of our legal system as our legal system now tries to prosecute one of the main leaders of the populist right. And, and I've pointed to you before to the very good work of Daniel Sablat and Stephen Levitsky to uh, Harvard professors, comparative politics, uh, studying European and Latin American political parties and politics. And Zablat in particular, and, and I won't uh, share the full long quotation from you, but Zablat, demonstrates that when conservative parties are pro-democratic in the sense that they recognize, acknowledge, endorse, and reinforce the idea that conservatives should only come to power via freely and fairly conducted elections, that in those conditions, democracy is stable. But when conservative parties become ambivalent or turn against democracy, 
that democracy has tended to be unstable in the modern world. And this reflects the work that political parties do in both selecting elites, right, political leaders who adhere to the norms of democracy, the rule of law, respect for institutions, and thereby inculcating support for core democratic norms in their followers. So this view suggests that political parties are institutions of political socialization and acculturation. When they are pro-democratic, they produce voters uh, and citizens who adhere to the norm that the winner of the election gets to exercise power for the next period, right? And when they turn against democracy, they very often succeed in undermining the support for democratic norms, what they call the guardrails of democracy, because institutions, constitutions don't interpret and enforce themselves. They depend on being met halfway by us, by the people, by our political culture, norms, and understandings. That right orientation doesn't just come from nowhere. It doesn't sprout up spontaneously overnight. It is implanted and cultivated in us by central civil institutions, especially by political parties. And so their warning is that in the 21st century in the United States, one of our two parties is turning against democracy and that based on their study of history, that is a very dangerous situation for the maintenance of democracy. And I, again, I think we have to look at the stress that the trial of Trump is going to put on our legal and political institutions in that context. Having said that, I don't think that means either that we shouldn't try Trump or that we should expect the trial of Trump to address the underlying fragility of democracy in the 21st century. I think instead what we need to do, and Wilma, I see you've got your hand up. Let me just finish this last point and, and, and then I'll, I'll pull out of the slides and, and be happy to take your question if it can wait. If not, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and, and say it now. But um, it seems to me that what we need to do prospectively is to begin to think through the question can we rebuild a fairer, a more inclusive, a more just and equal economy and society in the 21st century? And that to do that, what we need is a 21st century democratic political economy. That, that, that's what I'm going to call it. And, and uh, we need a whole range of policy initiatives. And we need to be able to say politically in our campaigns via our candidates that this is what we want to do. We don't want to tear down the judiciary, the FBI, the Department of Justice, the institutions that support the rule of law, but we also don't want to continue having them be organs for the articulation and growth of inequality and privilege. How can we remake those institutions in the 21st century to allow them to be organs of fairness and justice? And, and, and so let me just throw down some quick guideposts for then more concrete ideas that I want to share with you over the next couple of weeks. The first is to recognize that we require effective, democratically organized and accountable political power, and that we don't currently have it. And that part of the reason we don't have it is because the wealthy have become so powerful that they capture and control our central political institutions. So what we require from a democratic political economy in the first instance is that it prevent accumulation and concentration of wealth, especially 
intergenerational advantage that is incompatible with the equal opportunity of each and every citizen to influence public opinion and political decision making, right? And, and, and so how much inequality can we have and yet still be equally effective citizens and that we have to try to limit inequality into that bounded range. By the way, we also need an economy that produces equal standing and status security for all persons. One of the things I've been emphasizing is that a large portion of the American population feels as if not only are they insecure economically, but this means that the society doesn't give a damn about them, doesn't respect them, has no concern for them, treats them as if they are invisible and irrelevant. Next idea, democracy and social justice require a society without systematic status so subordination. And here I'm referring to race and national origin, gender and sexuality, the traditional forms that status subordination has taken in our society. And so we need an economy that erases the legacy of status inequality and realizes genuine fair equality of opportunity for all persons irrespective of social background. And I hope you can see how similar these two are, but the way in which the second idea really targets everyone and the third idea really targets people who have been the victims of historical status inequality, and that those are two sides of the same coin, not competing ideas. Fourth, that economic insecurity and excessive social inequality are corrosive of, of solidarity, trust, cooperation, well-being, and so they need to be bounded within a healthy range. That, that's the work that, that Diego Rivera image is doing, is indicating a much more solidaristic cooperative view of the economy as opposed to an individualistic and competitive view, which tend to produce not only inequality, but insecurity, and then, right, competition, and that further reinforces insecurity and scarcity. Uh, fifth, in an affluent society, people need good jobs. And, and, and so in a poorer society, perhaps people just want jobs. But in an affluent society, we want jobs that respect the dignity of the worker, treat them as participants in cooperative enterprises and society, give them opportunities for advancement, tap into their creativity, that, that we want to figure out how to generate not just jobs, but good jobs. That people also require jobs that are compatible with their other social roles and responsibilities. For instance, as care providers and families, that jobs cannot be all consuming, that they cannot leave you so exhausted that you have no time for civil engagement, for love, for fun, for other responsibilities, and they cannot demand that you be so constantly wired and tethered to work that you're constantly distracted by its demands. We obviously need to transition rapidly. We do not have time to an environmentally sustainable economy. And since 21st century capitalism is global, we need to connect domestic justice with global justice, if the price of domestic justice is undercutting or, or relying on global injustice, then we are not only being deeply unjust and unfair, but we're also going to prompt uh, levels of immigration that may very well destabilize what we're trying to do in this country. And, and so the conclusion of this idea, we need a democratic political economy for the 21st century, is that the way the economy is organized is obviously an economic issue, but it's not simply an economic issue. It affects every other aspect of society and the very sustainability of the planet. We are 
affluent enough, we are wealthy enough, we are rich enough to be able to think not only in terms of how wealth is distributed, but how good jobs are, how balanced our lives can be. And, and these are the tasks then that I want to start turning to as we think through how we can build a better economy for the 21st century. Wilma, thank you for waiting. Go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, hand in hand with all of this, if we don't improve our system of education, we're doomed. Uh, we put, and the education system is as biased and favoring to the elites as any other system in this country. So we have to democratize education, make sure that education reaches. You just have to see that the best schools are still in the affluent white neighborhoods to see that how bad it is. And the Ivy Leagues are unaffordable and that's still a prime education, although there are many others that are equally as good. Uh, but we just have to, because otherwise, I, I look at QAnon and I look at some of the craziness that people believe. And if they knew how to think critically, they could not be bamboozled in those ways. But we don't have that anymore. So I think that's a key component. Thank you, Wilma. And I couldn't agree more. And I, I put genuine fair equality of opportunity on that list of guideposts, right? And and I, I want to be as clear as possible. I think you've hit both nails on the head. Um, when we looked at deaths of despair, you probably noticed that the people who have the really high increases in mortality are people who are white and lack a college education, right? Because they are the ones who've been subject to the complete collapse of the pillar supporting both their economic and their social inclusion in society. That is to say, good, stable, unionized industrial jobs. And it used to be, frankly, you could get a mediocre high school degree and you could go work in industry. And as long as you were reasonably strong and diligent and had a good work ethic, you would be all right. In the 21st century, that's just not true anymore, right? And, and, and so one of the things that I think a lot of economists point to in terms of why the United States did so well in the 20th century economically is that we had the best educated workforce in the world and our workforce was educated in a way that met the needs of the economy. Right. And and so when I say you've hit both nails on the head, an even distribution of educational opportunity for all persons, irrespective of class, race, neighborhood, right, means equalizing funding for public elementary and secondary education. Right. And and, and so that is a, a major element of, of this. But then you also point to the Ivy Leagues, and I don't want to just say Ivy Leagues. I want to say any elite or competitive institution in the United States of higher education today is a dominantly wealthy institution, right? I, I, I teach at Sarah Lawrence College. Our student body, 80% of the domestic students come from the top 20% economically. And I enjoy teaching them. I, I, I'm very fond of them, but I have to squint to ignore the fact that part of what I'm doing in providing a good liberal arts education to these people is I'm reproducing the inequality of our society, right? Because it's only the people who can afford, and, and, and let's be clear about this, 70, 80, $90,000 a year for four years. Those are the people who get a good education at the collegiate level today. And if you can't, and, and the majority of Americans can't, 
it's more and more debilitating in terms of economic competitiveness, in terms of opportunity in a 21st century economy. So we have to fix access to higher education, especially elite education as well. Yes, thank you very much for two really good comments, Wilma. Who, anybody else wanna come in? Yes, yes Matt, sorry. go ahead. Yes, Matt, Matt go ahead. Sorry. Matt. No, I'm just trying to unmute. Just trying to unmute. A, word, a word or two. Word. Matt, give me one Matt, second. Give me one second. I'm going to mute everyone again. Mute and, again. And then I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself you to unmute. again. Because I think somebody else was unmuted and we were starting to get the echo chamber effect. Okay, okay. Matt, unmute yourself and go. I think I'm unmuted. You are. And I wanted to say a word or two in favor of competition. Uh, I spent my career uh, prosecuting the antitrust laws, which I have always considered to be one of the foundations of America's economic success in the world. And um, I would, would hate to see anything that, that uh, uh, interfered with the ability of Americans who can do it better to get paid for their success. <laughs> so that's my, my comment. Yeah. And I think it, it, it's worthwhile noting, and I don't have this precise data at the top of my head, but we have a concentration of economic power in terms of what's sometimes called duopoly, not per se monopoly, right? But where in each of the sectors, big sectors, right? And it's very obvious in, in, in communication and other forms of technology, you've got two or three companies competing with each other. And uh, the result is, right, that they are often able to set prices, that, that it's not genuine fair competition. And in particular, in technology, anytime it looks like there's a rival to the big five, they just buy it, right? And, and, and that um, uh, her, her last name is Khan. I'm forgetting her first name, but but the uh, person that Biden has put in charge of uh, prosecuting uh, antitrust uh, in his administration has actually been part of a, a new legal movement to really say, we did this well in the first half of the 20th century. We have to start doing this again. So yes, I, I, I do think anti-monopoly uh, being more competitive, making more room for startups and entrepreneurs is, is, is part of a dynamic economy. I think one of the big questions here is how much does a, a kind of 20th century model of a dynamic economy still inform 21st century policy goals? And I, I, I'm going to just put a little flag in that for future discussion. Uh, because I don't think today is the day to do it. David, go ahead. You gotta have, you're going to have to have to. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to build on uh, what you and Wilma were talking about in terms of the need for critical thinking. And I would point out that you can't have critical thinking if you have prior restraint on ideas and book banning and things like that, because uh, critique uh, requires something to, that can be critiqued. And if you control the flow of information, uh, that's a movement toward, um, uh, toward uh, 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 absolving any uh, the key ideas from critique. So, uh, so we can't tolerate the kind of book banning that we see going on, uh, a resurgence in that. And we have to uh, support the, the free flow of ideas, even ideas we don't want, because those are the ones that uh, ought to be most vulnerable to critique. Thank you, David. And um, I'll just point out very quickly, right, when I, I didn't really address that aspect of, of, of Wilma's comment, which is that a good education system is the prerequisite for, let's call it media literacy and media critical literacy. thinking, where what that involves is, right, the idea that we can discern what is true from what is obviously conspiracy, con conspiracy theory, theory etc. Uh, and, and Wilma pointed us to QAnon. 
And, and very quickly, I, I want to just, again, focus for a moment on the Dominion lawsuit against Fox and, and, and what we're learning. So it's, it's one thing to say QAnon is just, you know, crazy stuff that circulates in the dark corners of the web. But it's another thing to notice that the largest media outlet, the most watched source of news in the United States today has now been revealed to have its leading spokespersons on air amplifying and repeating, parroting with absolute confidence stuff that privately they acknowledged was completely fabricated and destructive disinformation. Right. And, and, and so how much can we ask our education system to prepare our students to be able to discern that their leading media figures are boldly lying to them on a regular basis? And I do worry about two things here. First is that QAnon, as I say, it meshes with, it has a very strong affinity with a feeling structure that is deeply rooted on the part of many Americans. Our government isn't working for us anymore. And that feeling structure is rooted in truths about our society, right? So QAnon is a completely fabricated and misleading way of explaining something that is true right our government isn't working for us anymore and frankly it's a lot simpler to understand and follow than well that's because of the way in which financing of elections occurs or the way in which primary elections are structured or lobbying or the Supreme Court striking down a campaign finance reform, not to mention globalization, automation, computer technology, changing the workforce, right? All of that stuff is quite anonymous, quite structural, and also, right, feels like the way in which people who you don't like talk, right? And, and, and so there's a way in which the QAnon theory connects with the feeling structure that makes it feel right to people. And, and, and again, I don't think we, we, we want to say these people are just stupid dupes, as opposed to they are searching for something that mainstream political discourse doesn't give them. And I don't know how much work we can ask how our education system, our education system as opposed to trying to our, um, oh, David, are you talking to me? I can't tell. Okay. But, but is the remedy okay. to ban those people from speaking these half truths and lies and through some kind of legal force, or is it uh, better education to uh, uh, to be able to uh, call call them out for what they are? And, and I think that's the issue. There was one other point I wanted to make about education, and that is that back in the day when you know we had the auto plans and you could uh, go through high school, maybe get a high school diploma, maybe go through a vocational education track that was intentionally non-academic and the like and get a decent job. The jobs that you get now through vocational and technical education require a hell of a lot of academic prowess because they're, they're not uh, uh, lifting things, they're uh, controlling electronic, very sophisticated electronics that do the lifting and monitoring for you. So what constitutes vocational education is very different from what it was 40 or 50 years ago. Yeah. Great point. I'm, yeah, I'm great point, you, David, because there's a lot of echo that comes back when you're not muted. So, so don't don't take that the wrong way. Uh, in terms of the the first thing you said, and and, and Marion, I'm going to come to you in just a second. I know you've been raising your hand. Um, the uh, idea that should we just silence the the people spouting the nonsense? I suppose that depends who the people are, and what I would say in particular is I really hope the Dominion lawsuit succeeds and that Fox News is forced to pay. And, and please note, I believe that what they're asking for is $1.6 billion 
dollars with a B, right? That 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 Fox News will be accountable for knowingly and maliciously spreading disinformation, right? So so that seems to me a legitimate kind of post facto accountability for spreading disinformation. That's very different from banning a book, right? And 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 so I do hope there will be some of that. Marion, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> What I want to say is that um, uh, the outsourcing that's happening uh, with uh, our industry uh, and some of the artificial intelligence has made it impossible uh, for a lot of people who have not had college educations, whether black or white, uh, so that the jobs are not available to get equality. Uh, how do we deal with that when Outsourcing seems to be an economic necessity because other people are taking salaries that Americans are not accepting, and therefore our jobs are disappearing. So, Marion, I'm going to offer you primarily a promissory note, which is is that that's exactly where I want to go in, in future lectures. So I'm, I'm not going to try to answer the question in detail today, but let me just say really quickly, Canada has done a lot better than we have. Germany, Austria, Norway, uh, I, I, I could keep going, right? Uh, all of that to say, it's one thing to say, yes, we're in a global economy where there's global wage competition and that drives wages down, especially for so-called unskilled labor. And then we come back to David's point that, that there's very little perhaps uh, labor that's unskilled remaining in our economy other than working for an Amazon fulfillment center or a Starbucks. But, but having said that, I, I would then add, right, you know, that it's not just that. It's, it's, it's automation, it's computer technology, right? And, and, and get ready because artificial intelligence is, is just going to quickly accelerate the degree to which humans become dispensable in so many economic processes, right? And, and, and so we have to be thinking, I think, systematically about these issues. But having said that, the fact that so many societies are facing exactly the same structural forces that we're facing, but doing much better, does indicate that this is not just structural fate. This is policy failure as well. And that reflects the fact that our political system has been captured and, and isn't interested in solving these problems. And that's part of where then the anger that leads to the support for a candidate like Trump, who is so destructive, comes from. So, so yes, that's where I'll be going. And I promise, Marion, I'll come back with more specific ideas next week, okay? Thank you. On which note, I'll just note very quickly that next week I'm going to give you a recorded lecture. I have to be on the road, but I will join you for the Q&A session. So I'll only be with you for 10 or 15 minutes next week instead of the full hour, hour and a half that we usually do together. But I'll continue with this lecture series you guys take care of yourselves, be well. It's fun as always being with you on a Saturday. I'll miss being live, but I'll get to have some interaction with you next week. And then we'll be back to regular the week after. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.